A man lived 44 years without a brain. But how? In 2007, a man in France went to the doctor. He was a husband, a father of two, and worked as a civil servant. His life, by all accounts, was completely normal. He was just getting checked because of a mild weakness in his leg. As a precaution, doctors decided to perform a scan of his head, and what they found challenged everything the medical world knew about the brain. His skull was not filled with a brain, it was filled with fluid. The organ that was supposed to house his thoughts, his memories, his entire identity, his consciousness, was, as a lead neurologist wrote, virtually absent. And yet, there he was, seeing, feeling, perceiving. He had no cognitive issues. His life was completely normal. This case presents a question that strikes at the very core of our existence, that is, the nature of consciousness. People often believe that the brain creates consciousness, that the brain with its billions of neurons is the source of who we are. But how do you explain a man who has a mind but no brain? The conventional model of consciousness explains that everything can be reduced to material processes. For example, light bounced on an object enters your eyes and is converted into electrical signals. The signals travel to the brain, which transforms them into an image. It's conceptualized as a biological machine. But even within this model, there is a mystery so profound it has its own name, the so-called hard problem. This was coined in 1995 by philosopher David Chalmers. It asks a simple question that science has not been able to answer. How do raw electrical signals miraculously transform into a subjective experience? How does the firing of a neuron make me perceive the color blue or turn into a feeling of awe? For decades, this hard problem was more of a philosophical exercise. But for neurologist John Lorber, it became a clinical reality. Over his career, he analyzed more than 600 cases of hydrocephalus, the same condition as a French man, where fluid builds up inside the skull. And what he found was staggering. These were not people with disabilities. They were, in fact, very normal people, living normal lives and often with above-average intelligence. There was one special case, a university student, socially normal, with a first-class honors degree in mathematics. His IQ was 126, placing him in the top tier of the population. Now, the average brain mantle thickness is about 4.5 centimeters, and this math genius's brain was only one millimeter thick. That is 44 times smaller than what it's supposed to be. This discovery created a paradigm shift. It was published in the journal Science in 1980 under the provocative headline, Is Your Brain Really Necessary? So what accounts for these cases? Some scientists propose that even with severe brain loss, there might be deep, invisible structures at work, performing functions we have always wrongly attributed to the cortex, structures that are way more important than we know, an invisible brain hiding from our scans. Yet theories like these are controversial and not proven yet. But it does raise the question, what if the brain isn't the origin point of consciousness at all? This is a parasium, a single-celled organism. It has no brain, it has no neurons, not a single synapse. Yet, it demonstrates purposeful behaviors. It swims, avoids obstacles, mates, and most significantly, it learns. It hints that a neurological brain may not be the prerequisite for intelligence at all. Dr. Stuart Hameroff, director of the Center for Consciousness Studies, believes that the key to consciousness is not neurons themselves, but their internal architecture, microtubules. Microtubules are tiny hollow tubes that form the scaffolding of every cell, including the paramecium. And in the human brain, they're the single most abundant protein. Hameroff notes that their periodic lattice structure is perfect for information processing. He, along with Nobel laureate physicist Roger Penrose, proposed a somewhat radical and controversial theory 
known as orchestrated objective reduction. They posit that these microtubules are not just cell scaffolding, they are more like quantum devices. Their theory suggests that microtubules act as antennas. They are bridges receiving information from a more fundamental level of reality, the quantum world, and transducing it into what we experience as consciousness. Under this theory, the brain is not a computer of simple neurons. It is more like a quantum orchestra, an orchestra where different sections perform in a symphony across multiple scales, each vibrating at different frequencies. The slowest rhythms are the brainwaves, the foundation of the orchestra, oscillating at just a few cycles per second. The individual neurons fire faster, playing the main melody at a thousand cycles per second. But the true artists are the microtubules. They vibrate in the megahertz range, that is millions of times per second. And according to this theory, all of these sections are playing from a score that originates at the quantum level. The microtubules act as a bridge, receiving these quantum signals and transforming them into consciousness. So as Hamroff concludes, consciousness is not a computation, it is more like music. Now, this is not the only alternative theory of consciousness. There are over 325 theories trying to explain it. Yet, if consciousness is quantum, it changes everything we thought we knew. Because if the three pounds of tissue in your skull is not the source of your identity, but merely the instrument, if your mind is not a computation, but more like a symphony, then it forces us to confront the most profound question of all. If the music doesn't stop when the instrument breaks, if consciousness doesn't die with the brain, then where does it go? Now, make sure to subscribe to watch part two and find out the answer to that question. Leave me a comment if you personally have any thoughts about where consciousness comes from and give this a thumbs up if you liked it.